started. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together and to worship you and to uh, learn of you. And I pray that your spirit would move among us this morning and that uh, you would fill us and that you would help us. Give us, give us hearts of worship and hearts of understanding so that we might be able to comprehend what you would say to us today. And we thank you for it, Lord. Bless each one as they're here now and those that are still coming. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stand if you want to. We're going to start off with a, a hymn that we just love, Like a River Glorious. Let's wait a moment, see what's happened with the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, internet issues this morning. You may have to sing songs from memory. <laughs> they can look it up on the internet, maybe. On yeah, everybody, look, I'll tell you what the song is, and you look it up on YouTube. <laughs> well, there's probably lyrics somewhere. <laughs> like a River Glorious lyrics. Google that. And then the, the second song we're doing, Echoes of Love, you wouldn't find on the internet because um, my pastor's wife, friend down in Oregon, wrote it. She and I wrote that one. So I won't have that one. But we'll give it another minute. If not, we'll just enjoy Amy playing the flute and you singing what words you can remember. Technology. Would everyone open their hymnal to page <laughs> 497, <laughs> please? <laughs> Sorry, who found it on their phone? Oh, it's up there? <gasps> Gloria! Thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right, here we go. And we'll start again. Oh, uh -huh. 
And this being communion week, we're going to focus on what the Lord has done for us. And this one's called, Come Behold the Myst Wondrous Mystery.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your willingness to give up your Son for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to bear our burdens and to die in our stead, and that you are victorious. Help us worship you today, Lord. Help us hear what you have for each one of us and give you the glory as we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And welcome. What a glorious day it is outside. And John Calhoun lost his ponytail. He'll be able to tell you all about that in the intermission. A couple of things going on. Um, this week, we're in full full motion now with our fall stuff. Ladies, uh, actually tonight, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, youth group at the Stringers, right? So first and third Monday of each month, so that's tomorrow. Tuesday is ladies' Bible study. They started last week, got their materials, all the different stuff. Now they're in lesson one. <clears throat> Stay caught up, ladies but it started, which is awesome. Also Tuesday, words of encouragement, Pastor Dan online, Facebook, YouTube, 5 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Tune in for that. Multi-part series going on, uh, Children of the Light from Ephesians. So if you need to keep caught up with that, you can go onto our website and you can listen to the prior um, lessons on that as well. Wednesday night, 6.30, men right here going through Abraham, hearing God's call this week is chapter 3, so come on out for that, guys. Um, like I said, we're in full fall mode. All the different activities are going on right now. We still have a need for nursery workers. If you've been feeling nudged by the Lord to get involved, and in, uh, this is one way to do that. There's many ways, but we could sure use one more helper with the little um, nurseries, right? Second Sunday of every month is, would be your rotation. 
That's pretty easily set up for you so you can see the schedule. If you have questions about that, Emily Helgeson can help you understand what's required and how to get plugged in for that. We have been doing a harvest party here since we've had a little church. So this is, I think, the sixth year of the harvest party, but it's on October 31st. It'll be from five to seven. We need a lot of helping hands to pull that off. And there's a sign-up sheet out here on the table. So if you wanna plug into that, we can't change the date. You know, it comes on the 31st every year, so that's when we do it. So we will set up the Sunday just prior on the 29th. If you would like to help set up, if you'd help, like to put flyers out in the neighborhood, all those different kind of details are spelled out on the sign-up sheet, so you can take part in that. If you have questions about that, Emily Helgeson is also a great source to ask how you can get plugged in. We talked about youth ministry. That's on this, uh, this week. The address is in here. If you, if you want to get involved with that and you can't get a ride, there's even a carpool. So contact Iola if you have any questions about how to get your youth to the youth ministry. There's a little competition among the guys in the barbecue pits. It's, it's healthy competition and it makes for really good food. So the men are having a barbecue cook-off. It's gonna be on November 4th. It starts at 1 p.m. That's when the grills fire up and the things get started. We don't all have to be there at 1 p.m. Uh, this year, oh, we all have to be there at 1 p.m. Caddy, don't be late. Um, she's bringing the, uh, some of the, the uh, bean toss games, I'm sure, right? So there's a competition for cornhole as well as the barbecue cook-off. The men have invited the ladies to come and partake in the food, right? We're not gonna let you compete yet because we don't wanna see all the blue ribbons going off with, with the gals. It could easily happen. Uh, we'll expand our, our minds another time and get to that place, right? But that's on November 4th. You can read all about it and uh, how much food and all that different stuff. It's a great time. So we also do, what's your Bible question? If you have Bible questions, if you're reading through your devotionals, you have something that just makes you wonder how or why, you can write that question out onto a sheet of paper that's on our sign-up table out here in the foyer. And every, uh, every so often, Pastor Dan unfolds the answers to those questions. So we wanna stay a part of that. You can see on the Save the Dates, there's a number of other things going on further out. It seems like December's a long way off, but we're already in October, so it's really not. Ladies Ornament Exchange and a White Elephant Exchange have dates pegged for that. With that, we'll dismiss the kids for Sunday school and be back for Dan's message. Thanks.
You got me on? Those that are out in the foyer, come on in. We're ready to get going again. John, is that whipped cream on top of that? It was. <laughs> My wife's not here to catch me. This isn't online today, is it? <laughs> All right. Let me just give you a, a, a little bit more information about the men's barbecue cook-off and the cornhole tournament. There's two different sign-up sheets out there. One's for the, the barbecue cook-off and the other is for uh, the cornhole tournament. So the, the men's barbecue cook-off, as John said, uh, it's men competing uh, like we did last year. Uh, but we're inviting the ladies to come and join us uh, to eat with us. And so everybody that is planning on coming, you need to sign up on that sign-up sheet. Uh, and then everybody that comes besides the competitors, the competitors are going to make enough food um, for 12 to 15 people, enough meat. Um, and then um, we'll have other people bring side dishes and desserts. So sign up for that. Um, and... Uh, you know, I don't want to say how many we're going to allow to compete. I will say that there's only, there's three prizes. There's a, a first, second, third prize, and you'll in, enjoy them. And then uh, the cornhole tournament, that is for men and women to compete. So like a husband and wife could be a team, or maybe a couple of gals, maybe not husbands, you know, maybe two different husbands and then their wives maybe comprise two different teams as well. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who the teams are. Um, but uh, so there's a sign up for that as well. So we want to know uh, Steve is going to kind of oversee that. Steve Wells is. And so he is asking whatever you, you decide, whoever's on your team, you have to come up with a team name. All right, so that's the first thing on the sign-up sheet is team name. And then the next column over is who comprises the team. And so in that one little space there, you'll put two names. And then, uh, and then the other thing we're, we're interested in is if you have a cornhole game, a regulation size cornhole game that is uh, 24 by 48, uh, if you can bring that, uh, for us to use. We're going to need, you know, if we have eight teams, then we need, uh, no, if we have 16 teams, then we need eight cornhole games because it's going to be single elimination. So everybody will play it at first, but then only the winners of those games will play in the next round until we get down to just one winner. And there is a prize, but it's only for the first place team. Uh, for the cornhole tournament. So hopefully that makes some sense. And uh, again, it's, it's kind of intricate, I, I realize, but uh, you'll figure it out, right? Uh, but it's going to be a great time. November the 4th, 1 o'clock. Most people will cook the food before they come and bring it, and we will have um, the... Uh, you know, the trays out there that have the heat underneath them. What do they call those things? Chafing, dish. chafing dishes, yes. We will have chafing dishes. We'll have a chafing dish for every competitor. So right now we have five chafing dishes. So if we have seven or eight competitors, then we might need to get some more chafing dishes. But we'll have all that ready, ready to go. So when you come, you can transfer the food into the chafing dishes and then uh, we'll have uh, places for the side dishes as well. Anyway, it's going to be a blast, and it's going to be good eating. Yes. All right? Okay, so let's turn in our Bibles now to Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. 
We're going to be covering, uh, this is a long chapter, 72 verses, so we're not going to cover all of it today. We're going to cover the first 26 verses this morning. So Mark 14, 1 to 26. For our scripture reading, uh, we're going to read two sections of that. We're going to read verses 3 to 9, and then we're going to jump ahead and read verses 22 to 26. So I'll read the first uh, and every other verse, and then you guys can read the alternating ones that I don't read as we go through it together. So let's stand. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now jump ahead to verse 22 and carry on. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we just pray. Uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, I'll be able to communicate clearly the things that you've laid upon my heart, and that when all is said and done, we'll see you in it, and we'll see uh, what it is that you want us to learn from it and put into practice in our lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. Before we get into the study, I just want to say, you know, we had a little technical thing going on there this morning uh, with the screens, and uh, you know, when I uh, when, when I, I saw that happening, uh, I realized, you know, there's a there's a whole lot of moving pieces that go into uh, putting our service on every Sunday, and it's just not, you know, we come in the door, we sing some songs. And, you know, we hear the word and, and then we fellowship and out we go. But uh, there's, a, there's a big technological aspect to this. And it's, it's many moving pieces. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't understand it all, to be honest with you. But uh, we're having a problem with the Internet this morning. And for those that may be watching online, uh, if you're getting a, a little skippiness in the the broadcasts, it's because of our internet issues. Um, so when, when the internet goes down, that's a, that's a big part of it, you know. And, uh, and then, you know, when the internet goes down and everything is connected to the internet, you know, so what goes on comes up on the screens, uh, the, you know, the lyrics, there's all kinds of equipment back in this room over here. And, and then we got the TVs out in the foyer and all that. It's all kind of interconnected. And when one thing goes wrong, uh, usually a lot of things go wrong. Uh, and then, of course, we're streaming uh, out beyond us here. And, you know, we have people that watch every week. Um, and so when, when you know, their, the service is interrupted for them, then that's a problem, too. So, like I said, a whole bunch of moving 
pieces, and I am just so, so very thankful for the, the, the folks that uh, do that, to take care of that for us. Very faithful um, servants of the Lord uh, that sit in that room every week and sit out here in the foyer to control the sound and just all that stuff. I love these guys and, and gals, and they just do a great job. So just, just know that uh, these, these folks are really um, serving you. They're serving you, and they're serving people outside of this building, too. And we're thankful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, all the glory to God, but thanks to the ones that, that uh, put so much time into it. All right, so if you were here last week, you know that Jesus has just finished discussing the events of his second coming with his disciples. It was very important that they know these things, and especially now because of what would happen in the next few days of, of their lives. Jesus was about to be arrested, treated as a criminal, and executed. It would seem like everything that they had been looking forward to up at that point, up to that point, was now going to go down the drain. So Jesus wanted them to know that the story would not end with his death. It wasn't going to be, you know, like the end of some movies today. They don't do it as much anymore. But in the old days, at the end of a movie, and when it was all over with, they would put the words, the end, up on the screen. It wasn't going to be the end for them. Instead, it would actually be a continuation of the greatest story ever told. How many of you read that book? I mean, have, how many of you have seen the book? Okay, a couple of old people here. <laughs> It's a great, great book, the greatest story ever told by Fulton Ausler, uh, published in 1949, which is why many people haven't heard of it. But millions of copies of this book have sold over the years, and they made uh, a couple of movies out of it as well. Uh, but it would be a continuation of that, essentially. Now, it may seem like everything is ruined at that point, but it isn't. It isn't. And boy, do I wish that I could learn this lesson. I wish I could learn it. Sometimes I think everything is ruined, but it isn't. Now, maybe a while back, things were going great for you in the Lord. It didn't seem like it could ever get bad again. But now things have really degenerated. They have gone from bad to worse. And maybe you're even feeling a little like giving up. But let me tell you something. Don't do it. Don't give up. Please hang in there for a little while longer. I know it's hard. But listen, the story isn't over yet. The end is not flashed up on the screen. The tough time that you may be going through isn't going to last forever. This too shall pass, as has often been said. The night won't last. The day is coming. And so is Jesus. He is coming again. There is hope for you if you're a tired Christian. There is hope for you if you're a discouraged or a suffering Christian. I love the words of Psalm 30, especially Verses 4 and 5 and 11 and 12. Verse 4 says, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And verse 11 says, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothe me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I give you, I give thanks to you forever. Now, this doesn't mean that 
you know, you ignore the problems of today. It doesn't mean that at all. Whenever we experience a trial and a challenge, there's always something to learn from it. There's always some element of it that will make us smarter and stronger if we respond the way that we should instead of allowing ourselves to panic in a frenzy. So we shouldn't seek to ignore the problems of today, nor should we overreact to them. I sure don't recommend that we leave the Lord behind in the midst of them. The problems don't go away if we leave the Lord behind. They usually only get worse. Well then, how do we deal with the problems that we face? How do we approach them? I'll tell you how. With the same resoluteness as Jesus. You continue to move forward with this as your number one focus. Yet not what I will, but what you will. We'll see that next week when we get into the second part of the chapter in verse 36. But it's really, it's really a beautiful example of sacrificial love. Jesus is our example here this morning. So let's just take a look at, at how he did this so that maybe we can learn some pointers from him. Jesus and two others will teach us what sacrificial love is about. And then the Jewish leaders, along with Judas Iscariot, will show us what selfish betrayal is about. And as we begin the chapter, the first thing we see is that selfish betrayal really makes no sense at all. No sense at all. Verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him, notice, by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. Now, the Jewish leaders should have been expecting Jesus. So knowing what we know about these guys, as the religious leaders of the Jewish nation, these guys are really the definition of a contradiction. They are a real contradiction. Again, they are the chief priests, right? And they are the scribes who are the teachers of Israel. They were supposed to be the standard bearers of the God of the universe. They were supposed to be the representatives of Almighty God. And yet here... They are planning a premeditated murder. They're not seeking to arrest Jesus on some legitimate charge or, and try him on some legitimate crime against the country or against God. Instead, the verse says that they wanted to take him by trickery and put him to death. The word for trickery means to bait by fraud, guile, and deceit. It means to be crafty. Now when we say someone is crafty in this context, we don't mean that they're good at rubber stamp art uh, or making greeting cards or ceramic pots or anything like that. That's not the kind of crafty we're talking about. We're talking about deceitful. It means deceitful. It's really a form of extreme dementedness. They hated Jesus more than anything in the whole world at this point. Yet he had never, Jesus had never hurt anyone in his whole brief life. He had only done good as he healed the sick, delivered people from demons, and raised the dead. All he ever had done was love them. But since it wasn't a crime to love others... They had to come up with something deceitful, something crafty to get rid of him. They wanted someone to get rid of Roman domination for sure. But they were sure Jesus wasn't the guy to do it. 
they likely believed that if Jesus were allowed to gain a huge following, this man of peace and love would make things worse for them. They wanted things to get better quickly. You see, selfish betrayers don't understand that sometimes things, uh, before things can get better, they first have to get worse. Now notice something interesting about this. Right about this time, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 26 too, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. This is, this is, he said this at the same time of this you know, period that we're reading about here. In other words, Jesus knew that before things would get better, they would actually get a lot worse. Not better, but worse. You see, Jesus had an ability that we don't have. He knew what the future held because he was omniscient. He knew that in two days he would be arrested, he would be brutally beaten, he would be crucified, he would be forced to endure tremendous pain. And he didn't run away. Why? Because he also knew that after three days, he would rise again from the dead. Things would indeed get better after they had gotten worse. So he was willing to go through it. It really isn't hard to understand this principle. It's something people deal with all the time. If you had, let's say, severe headaches every single day, and you went to the doctor, and you were diagnosed with a brain tumor the size of an orange, and then if your doctor told you that you'd die if you didn't have brain surgery to have it removed, the recovery of which would also be long and no doubt somewhat painful and, and also with great risk, but with a more than likely positive outcome. If, if you had that scenario in front of you, would you go through with it? Well, I, I realize that many people would. Many people wouldn't. Probably more would than wouldn't. Why? Because though it's uncomfortable now, chances are it will be better later on. You would do it because you understand that sometimes things, before things can get better, they, they have to become worse. Now, people who are selfish betrayers, they don't get this. They want what they want right now, and they are not willing to go through anything difficult to get it. Now, I'm going to explain that more in a little bit here. But, but you understand, not everyone hated Jesus like these religious leaders. In contrast to those who hated them, there were also those who loved him intensely, which brings us to our next point. Sacrificial love is always the result of fully, fully appreciating what God has done. Our first example of this is a man by the name of Simon the leper in the first part of verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. Now notice the dinner was at the home of this fellow, Simon the leper. Now, now even though he was called Simon the leper, he, he didn't still have leprosy or else no one would have come to his house for dinner. They wouldn't eat, have eaten his food. Lepers were social outcasts, and they couldn't come near anyone. They had to live outside town and, and could have really no contact with even friends and family. Since Simon was hosting a dinner, no doubt, he was one that Jesus had healed of his leprosy. He was a a man who had been acquainted with all sorts of grief. Lepers had one of the most dreaded diseases known to man at the time, and he had been at the bottom of the pit for a long time, probably. He knew what desperation was all about, but he wasn't there anymore. Jesus must have healed him. 
Remember Psalm 30, uh, verse 5, the last part of it. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Simon had experienced his weeping for a night, but now it was morning and he was rejoicing. He showed his rejoicing by blessing others with what God had blessed him with and by blessing Jesus because he was the one who was responsible for his rejoicing. Okay, that's Simon the leper. Then we have Mary of Bethany. Now she's not named here, uh, but uh, if, if you look at John chapter 12, it seems that this woman being described here is Mary of Bethany. As he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. You see, Mary knew what sorrow and grief were all about, just like Simon the leper had known. Different experience, but the result was the same in both of their lives. She had experienced the blessing of being a follower of Christ, but she'd also experienced the devastating trials that life often brings our way. Jesus was one of her closest friends. They had a, a deep love and they had a deep fellowship for each other. She was totally devastated. I'm sorry, she was totally devoted to Jesus as she sat at his feet listening to him teach. Remember back in Luke 10.39, uh, it says, And she, Martha, had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She was devoted to him. She loved him. But then her brother got sick. And they sent for Jesus to come. But he didn't come right away. Her brother died and she experienced the bitter grief in the morning that goes along with losing a loved one. But then finally Jesus did come. And he filled her heart with joy again. She expresses that joy by giving sacrificially to Jesus. She appreciated so fully and completely what Jesus had done for her family. She was willing to express that appreciation in this wonderful gift of sacrificial love. After the finally came, she understood completely. That's what I, uh, I believe we've got to wait for, the finally. Finally. Listen, folks, no matter what difficulty or hardship you face today, know that the finally is coming. It hasn't come yet, but it is coming. Simon the leper experienced it. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, experienced it. And I, I believe that we, too, will experience it in time. No matter what you're going through today, the end hasn't come yet. Finally is coming. And when that happens, that's when the joy comes. That's when the rejoicing comes. And from that, we learn that those who don't appreciate God's great love or don't appreciate it fully will often think that sacrificial expressions of love are extreme and wrong. Now look at this in verse 4. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Now, I like the way Mark puts this. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. He, he's really going easy on the 12, I think, by saying that. That, after all, is who these people were, the 12. Mark, Matthew 26, 8 says, But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? So it gives us a little fuller picture. And they call this sacrificial act of love that Mary was engaged in, they called it 
a waste. The ones who should have been the most devoted to Jesus were actually the ones rebuking Mary for her act of worship. You know, that's the way many people view Christians who are serious about their faith and their devotion to Christ. They say, what a waste. I remember when I gave my life to the Lord and I moved away from all of my friends and moved down to the beach, um, I heard from a, another fellow who later got saved and came down and met with me. And he, he said, you know, all of our old friends, they're, they're, they're saying, oh, poor Dan. Oh, poor Dan, what a waste. You know, he's, he's not having any fun anymore. <laughs> he's wasting his life away. You know, for Christian doctors and scientists who devote their learning and their skills to alleviating the, the suffering of others in third world countries, for those guys, they say, oh, what a waste. These guys could be working for prestigious institutions, making tons of money, but instead they work for next to nothing. What a waste. For Christian lawyers who offer their, I know you, you think, can there be Christian lawyers? <laughs> of course there can be. There's, there's some lawyers watching, right? For Christian lawyers who offer their legal services free of charge to those who are being harassed by the government, they say, what a waste. They could be working for prestigious law firms, making tons of money, and maybe setting themselves up for some political office. What a waste, they say. For you and I who devote our time and our talent and our money to Christian causes, they say, what a waste. They could be getting more R&R, &R, or they could be earning more money on the side, or they could be partying and having more fun. What a waste. They don't get our devotion and sacrifice. It's because they don't understand the incredible debt of gratitude that we have because of God's great love for us. Now, according to John 12, it was actually Judas Iscariot who was the instigator of all of this. It was because he was the keeper of the money bag, and he used to steal from it. This perfume was worth more than a year's wages, 300 denarii. Now, today in Cleelum, the median household income is almost 53 thousand dollars. So this was really no small amount of money that was being devoted to Jesus. The argument was that this amount of money might have helped a lot of poor people who were poor because of no fault of their own. Could have relieved some of their suffering. But notice that at least for Judas, the spokesman for the group, his problem was really one of self-interest, not a concern for the poor. He was more concerned with padding his own pockets than he was with helping the poor. And, and it's this same self-interest that often causes us to be overcome by our trials. We get into this woe is me attitude. Instead of trying to figure out what God may be trying to teach me, through the trial, we resort to victimizing ourselves and blaming others, including God, for why things aren't better. And when we think like this, we're really messed up, as Jesus says here. Look at verse 6. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me you do not always have, or you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told, also be told as a memorial to her. And in fact, that's true, right? Because we're reading about it right now. 
So what is more important than anything in the whole world? Is it the poor and needy, helping the poor and needy? Is it helping the underprivileged? Is it my job or my spouse or my kids? Is it myself? If we think the answer to any of those questions is yet, then we probably don't really appreciate the great love that God has shown us and that Jesus has modeled for us. Here's what's more important than anything else in the whole world. It is total and unreserved devotion to Jesus Christ. That is more important than anything. Now, some people don't like to hear that. Judas Iscariot was certainly one of them. And it was probably his anger over this incident and others like it that caused him to do what he did next. And from it, we learn that selfish betrayal never, never, never has a good result. You see, selfish betrayal sometimes happens when we don't get what we want when we want it. Verse 10, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Judas wanted that money, you see. This was no small issue with him. He wanted that money. And if he couldn't get it by stealing from the community purse, he'd get it another way. Matthew 26, 15 says that the chief priests offered him 30 pieces of silver or 120 denarii or almost half a year's wages. This was a whole lot more than what he would have received if he had skimmed off of the top of the full year's wages that they would have received by selling that bottle of perfume. He was really in the money now. For many, it would have been woo-hoo. But I want us to all see something here. Instead of trying to get something for himself, Judas should have given himself totally to Jesus. He was dissatisfied. In his mind, things weren't going good at all. And what he should have done was to totally surrender his heart and his life to Jesus, right? You see, selfish betrayal never gives us what we want. Look ahead to verse 18. Now, as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to one another one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? He answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Now Jesus is saying here what the consequences would be for the one who betrayed him. His betrayer would regret the day that he was born. But Judas didn't believe it. He believed that he knew better. No doubt Judas had an agenda in this scheme of his. He wanted to enrich himself with money instead of enriching himself with devotion to Jesus. But did he? No. He saw a better way. He saw an easier way. And as far as he could see, it was going to get him everything that he ever wanted. And that's sometimes our problem, isn't it? As far as we can see. How far is that? In reality, not very far, right? God can see so much farther than we can see. He knows what the outcome of our decisions will be. He knows what uh, our decisions will ultimately cost us. 
So in the case of Judas, what was it going to cost him? It was going to cost him everything, starting with he was going to have to betray Jesus Christ. And in just a very short time after this, it would cost him his very life. Here's an important thing for us to remember. When we neglect God's word and his way, and we choose the easy way or the sinful way, it always involves one thing. It involves the betrayal of Jesus Christ. We're saying that we don't care about his will or his word. We're saying that we know better than him, that we are smarter than him. We are saying he's wrong and we're right. Do you see how arrogant and self-centered and blasphemous that is really? To think that I am smarter than the God of the universe? Now, we don't usually think of it that way. I, I understand that. We usually just think, oh, well, I've got a better idea than that. But that is, in essence, what we are saying. We are saying we know better than God. And what do we gain from this selfish betrayal? Absolutely none of the things that we thought we would. Instead, we gain everything that we thought that we wouldn't. Instead of satisfaction, we gain disappointment. Instead of pleasure, we gain discontent. Instead of fulfillment, we gain frustration. In fact, we have the potential of losing everything like Judas did. We need to stick with Jesus because he is really the only one who will bring us through this this thing that we're going through. Selfish betrayal never delivers what it promises. Our last point is this. Sacrificial love always leads to a good result, even though it may not be evident at first. As we've talked many times before, Jesus was in complete control of his act of sacrificial love. Look at verse 12. Now, On the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever, the, wherever he goes, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. So his disciples went out, came into the city, and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve. So this was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Many of the commentators believe that this was Thursday evening when they gathered in the upper room for the, the Passover celebration. For them, evening was any time from 3 p.m. to sundown. Now, these verses uh, from verses 12 to 17 suggest the very point we're making here, that Jesus was in complete control of what would take place in the next 24 hours and beyond. The disciples wanted to know how they could celebrate the Passover with Jesus. And Jesus lays out for them this intricate plan. Go into the city, look for the guy who is carrying the pitcher of water. Okay, that, that seems pretty general. Uh, in a city that size, how many people would be carrying a pitcher of water? Probably a lot, right? Then again, maybe it wasn't so general because carrying a pitcher of water was usually women's work. It was the women who would go get the water. For a man to carry a jar of water might be something like a guy carrying a purse. Though today, maybe that's not so unusual, right? <laughs> but then they're, they're not to, 
really say anything to the guy. They're just to follow him, right? They're supposed to follow him and apparently just walk right into the house that he goes into. And when they do, they're going to encounter the master of the house, possibly the owner. Then they're to say to the man, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then the guy would show them this fully furnished upper room that would have an outside entrance up a flight of stairs so that they would be able to prepare the Passover feast there and just celebrate it in privacy. Now that sounds like a guy in complete control to me. Those are a lot of details, a lot of moving parts. I know that, that some of the commentators think that Jesus somehow arranged this beforehand. I suppose it's possible, but uh, I think it's presented to us this way in order to let us know, even if he had prepared it beforehand, he was still in complete control. In fact, that demonstrated that he was in complete control. He knew that he was about to become the once for all Passover lamb who would take away the sins of the world. He'd known this probably all his adult life. When he came to John the Baptist to be baptized, you remember what John the Baptist said in Jesus' hearing. He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Both John and Jesus knew what that meant. As the Lamb of God, he would have to die to accomplish the taking away of the sins of the world. If it were me, and I knew this was coming, I would run for a cave to hide out until the danger had passed. But not Jesus. He went straight toward it because he was in complete control of every aspect of it. He knew he had to sacrifice himself and commit the ultimate act of love so that mankind would have a chance of being saved. None of this caught him by surprise. In fact, it was an appointment that he had made from all eternity. 1 Peter 1.20 says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Jesus knew every single detail of what would happen to him, and he didn't run from it. Instead, he ran toward it. That should really give us some inspiration, that even when the road of our lives gets tough, We can trust God to accomplish his purposes in and through us. He is in total control, and guess what? He will never let us down. His purposes will be accomplished. The last thing I see here is that sacrificial love is the result of appreciation and worship. We will be able to love sacrificially when we really learn to appreciate what God has done and will worship him for the same. Look at verse 22 now. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is said for you. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Once again, Jesus was about to experience the greatest trial of his life. He was about to have his body broken and his blood shed. He even previews that as he passes out the food in this supper. And yet he and his disciples end this preview of his agonizing suffering to come, they end it by singing a hymn. Interesting, huh? How could he do this? We probably wouldn't. (laughs) 
Now, it's thought the hymn comes from Psalms 115 to 118, and I would encourage you to read those Psalms and see if you don't understand this a little better. There is no doubt about it. They are some of the most praise-filled, faith-filled, trust-filled, and worship-filled scriptures in the whole Bible. And I think they were a vital key, an extremely important key to helping Jesus face and endure the trials that he went through. I don't think we, we really understand how important praise and worship is for us. I'm not saying it's a cure-all like some people do, but I am saying, uh, what I am saying is that when we are experiencing a real trial in our life, when our faith is being challenged like never before, we need to enter into God's presence so that we can be encouraged and we can be filled with his power. We all need that. What usually happens is we get so discouraged, we don't think about or don't feel like praise and worship. And so we don't do it because I don't feel like it. I don't do it. But I believe that's an attitude that is brought on by the enemy because he knows what praise and worship will do for us. Praise and worship really does make a difference when we're down. And it really helps to prevent us from getting down also. Again, I'm not saying the problems will go away just because we worship the Lord when we're feeling down. But our attitude about them will oftentimes change. And we'll have the renewed strength to continue on. The scripture says that when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And what would take place on the Mount of Olives? Jesus would be arrested there in an event that would lead to his torture and his death. Let's let that verse be an example to us of how to overcome the worst kind of distress and discouragement and suffering. I said this at the beginning, but I want to say it again. It may seem like everything is ruined, but it isn't. Maybe a while back things were going great for you in the Lord. It didn't seem like it could ever get bad again, but now things have really degenerated. They have literally gone from bad to worse. Maybe you even feel like giving up. But don't. Please hang in there for a little while longer. I know it's hard. But the story isn't over yet. The tough time that you're going through isn't going to last forever. This too shall pass. The night won't last. The day, the light is coming. And so is Jesus. He's coming again, but he's coming for you too. There is hope for you if you're a tired Christian. There is hope for you if you're a discouraged or a suffering Christian. Let us make praise and worship something that we do every day along with prayer and the reading of God's word. Let's be sure we take our preventive medicine as well as our medicine that we're not, when we're not feeling well. That is what will get us through. That is what will encourage us toward sacrificial love and steer us away from selfish betrayal. Father, we thank you for your word again today. We thank you for your goodness and your help in our time of need. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us, that you will help us to understand these principles, help us to apply them to our lives. And wherever we're at right now, with whatever is going on in our lives, I pray that you will give us hope, that you will help us to see beyond what we're going through right now, and help us to realize that you are there and that you are helping us to get through it and that you will eventually help us, and we will get through it. And we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody agreed saying, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, 
share communion now. And uh, as we do, once again, we're going to uh, make the, the uh, elements available up here in the front. We'll ask you to come forward and serve yourself. Take it back to your seat. And then um, we'll make a couple of comments. And then we'll all partake together as we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper on this first day of the month. Uh, in the meantime, while you're coming and helping yourself, or maybe you're, you know, serve somebody that you're with, uh, Carol or Coral is going to uh, lead us, not lead us, she's going to play uh, some music while we're doing that, and then, and then we'll uh, celebrate together, okay? So when you're ready, come on up. gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you revealed to us in this, in this celebration that you had with your disciples, that you were getting ready to offer up your body as a sacrifice for our sins. And open up the pathway for us for forgiveness in a new relationship with you. So we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Let's partake of the bread together. And then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so Lord, thank you for the blood of this new covenant, this new covenant that basically says that if we place our trust in Jesus Christ, if we confess our sins, and we ask for forgiveness from truly a broken heart that you will forgive us and that you will wash us and cleanse us. We thank you for that, Lord. That's that new covenant. 
where you shed your blood for many. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, let's partake of the cup now. Praise you, Lord. And so like the disciples on that first night where they shared this supper with Jesus, as they sang a hymn, that's what we're going to do. Well, it's not, not technically a hymn, but it's actually written by a Calvary Chapel pastor, this song, Richard Semino. It's called Forever. Let's stand. Tell me how you bore so much shame to love me. And when the heavens pass away, all your scars... Before you leave, don't forget uh, harvest party sign-ups out there on the table, men's barbecue, cook-off, and cornhole tournament. Sign up today, okay, before you go. And we'll see you next Sunday or early next middle of the week if you come to one of the middle of the week events. All right, God bless you. Have a great day.